We are going to finish up this mini-series, if you want to call it tonight. Um, uh, from my time away on sabbatical and just reflecting on what I feel like the Lord wanted to bring back to our church here. And as I reflected on that, I think about what we have been given. I mean, the Lord has blessed us with this new facility that we have. And compared to a lot of churches out there uh, during this COVID virus, our church has really stayed together as a family. Uh, we're stable and growing. Uh, we just got our financial report for the month of November, and we're still in the black for the year, which I think there are very few congregations could stay that. And so I think we're in a really good place as we move forward into next year and how we can impact our community with the gospel. And tonight I want to look at how we can do this. And I want to continue with some specific input from some of the other books that I read. I'm going to be looking at three different ones tonight, and I'm not going to be going into detail with those. But I think they're, they really were helpful uh, as we look at how we're going to minister to our community. The first book that I looked at, I want to talk about tonight, and I'm not going to quote it, but it was a book that was really personal. It was called Dangerous Calling, and it was written by Paul Tripp, and it was challenging me personally as a pastor. And I want to share these insights with you as your pastor, and I think there's some application for all of us there with this. And the first insight was that he talks about is, I have not arrived and I will not arrive in this lifetime. I think many times uh, congregations put pastors on a pedestal and uh, I struggle with sin just like the rest of you. And I have to submit myself daily to the Lord and I need to be in the scriptures daily. And that battle is going to continue until I either go home to be with the Lord or he returns to come and get me. And I have to make a priority in my own life to keep my personal walk with the Lord right. And I think it's so important for each of us to do that. And so I have not arrived and I must, and I won't arrive in this lifetime. And I don't think any of us have. And most people don't have that struggle, but I think sometimes uh, pastors do. And it goes to the next one. I can think of myself more mature and capable than I really am. Because I stand before the congregation every week, and you are very gracious and loving to me, and you always tell me nice things, I can start believing those things, and I forget what I am. And I need accountability in my life, and unfortunately a lot of times pastors isolate themselves and they don't have that. I need godly leadership around me to keep me grounded. Uh, Sherry is a crucial part of that in my life and I must choose to allow her to speak into my life because she's the one that knows me the best. And I must be humble and transparent with both her and leadership and allow them permission to challenge me. And again, for those of you that are married, your spouse is the best person you know that can do this for you. But we all need people in our lives and we need to have that accountability and for all of us we need somebody of the same gender of us that we will allow to speak into our lives and we need to allow them to ask us tough questions third i must always apply what i'm preaching to myself before it become, comes to you before i stand before you with the word of god it must first impact my life otherwise i'm a pharisee and I think that goes for all of us. We must always be allowing the Holy Spirit and the Bible to speak to us and apply it to our lives. Otherwise, we are dangerous and we hurt people rather than help them. And then the last one in this little bit of series is I am at war. We are all at war. And I think often we forget that. A war for our souls, a war for our families, a war for our church, and a war for our communities. Our enemy is Satan and his demonic army. And Paul tells us in Ephesians 6.12, he says, For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, 
against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Again, often these demonic forces will manifest themselves in people who are being controlled by Satan, just as, Satan, as Judas was being betrayed when he betrayed Jesus. But once they are disarmed, the people that were being used as instruments of Satan are no longer enemies, and they need to be loved by us. We see this in the scriptures. When Jesus would cast a demon out of someone, what immediately did he do? He ministered to them. And we need to realize that that's what God is calling us to do. And we need to realize who the real enemy is. The other thing we need to realize is that there's going to be casualties. And some of those casualties will be those that are among us. And this should neither surprise us or cause us to be afraid, but it should challenge us and keep us on the alert and stay close to the Lord. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8, 9, he says, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. You see, we must always guard our hearts and relationships with the Lord and with others. Satan and his demons can destroy us. So we're in this together, and we must all walk in humility, unified, and in loving one another in order to accomplish God's purpose in our life and for his church. And as I progress on, the next book really talks about that as well, and that was Churches That Heal. And I'm just going to quote a few things from Doug Moran's book, but here's some insights he said that about being churches that really heal. And I know that's one of our emphasis that we want to be. He says that churches that heal make certain that every facet of their ministry is people-oriented and relationship-based. Success is defined in those intangible terms of hearts that have been bonded together as we all discover Christ together. It is measured in the growth of healthy, life-giving relationships. It is demonstrated when we become vulnerable with one another, talk about our sins together, and encourage others, uh, one another to toward spiritual growth. When we learn to give and receive ministry from someone other than the big guy in the pulpit, and I, I love that quote, the big guy in the pulpit. I am not a big guy, but I think you get the gist of what he's saying here. You see, ICC is not about me. We need to be bonded together with other believers in our church family. He speaks of how a sinful past life in his book also hinders us and from moving forward in the future and for people. And how do we help people overcome their past? Now, this is uh, one of the last quotes that I had in his book, but I thought it was so good in that. He said, there's something very disarming about a healing church's refusal to identify their pe people by their sins. People caught in tra tragic habits can sense when they come into a congregation whether they're being identified by what they've done or by the image of God that it has given them. Their barriers go down when they recognize an env environment of unconditional love. And in such an environment, they can be healed. So I think one of the great blessings and also the challenges of living in Ignacio is that the majority of people here have been here all their lives, or most of them. Everyone knows everyone's stuff. As your pastor, I know most of your stories and where you come from. I know many of the past sins and the difficulties that they have caused you and others. But I also see the grace of God that brought you through these difficulties. And one of the greatest blessings I have experienced as a pastor is to watch God's grace heal and grow and lead many of our congregation into the ministry. 
And I agree with what Murray said when he stated this. He said, watching one another become, I'm convinced, is one of the most exciting parts of being a church that heals. Again, churches that heal focus on being loving, accepting sanctuaries for people who have been battered and shipwrecked in the world. It is a place to heal, to grow and eventually to serve. I believe we're becoming more and more that kind of a church. And I believe a big part of that is to celebrate recovery ministry that we've started in the church and been going for the last year. And I ask permission from Teresa to share just a little bit about her. Teresa gave her testimony at Celebrate Recovery. She is our main leader, and she gave her testimony on Monday night, and it was powerful. She talked about being in this church for the last 18 years, and I have been here through all of the struggles with her and watched the Lord do a work in her life even as she struggled. And I see her as an example of one that's becoming. She helped start Celebrate Recovery, and she is a part of that now. I believe that is a key part of becoming a church that heals, is helping people as they live life and become what God wants them to be and fulfill His purpose for their lives. And that brings me to the last book that I wanted to talk about tonight, and that is Good News to, to the Poor. And it's written by Tim Chester. And his book really challenged me to rethink the way I see poor people and how we minister to them. Again, I spent a fair amount of time talking about the poor when we went through the book of James, and it really challenged me there as well. But I believe this should be a major focus of our church for two reasons. First of all, it is very important to the Lord. There are hundreds of verses in the Bible about how we are to minister to the poor. And the second one is that we live in a community there where there is a significant population that is poor. And he challenges us on making the ministry to the poor a priority. This is what Chester has to say in that. He says, some people say that church leaders should focus on teaching the word of God. They are right. Those who have been gifted, given the gift of Bible teaching by God should teach God's word. The problem comes when this is combined with an unevangelical clericalism in which the role of the pastor teacher defines the identity of the whole church. Church life revolves around the leader, so such ministry is seen as the only valid ministry. But this is not a New Testament view of the church. In the church, each member has distinctive gifts from God and therefore distinctive ministry to fulfill. In the Reformed and Puritan traditions from which evangelicalism sprung, the role of the deacons was responsible was to be responsible for the social involvement of the church, following the pattern of Acts chapter 6, 1 through 7. You see, what he's challenging is that we all become busy in the ministry and doing what we're supposed to be doing. One of that ways is through our deacon ministry. And we're going to have an opportunity next week, and if some of you have already voted, we're going to be electing two new deacons into that ministry. We have the closed closet, which I think is a very important and wonderful ministry, and they need help to continue and expand. By the way, Laverne Madrid had shoulder surgery today, this week, and she's out for a couple of months. And so there needs to be help to keep it going. And right now they aren't open, but they're putting clothes out in the hallway to help people uh, because of the COVID. But we're continuing that ministry even as they're shut their doors for right now. But if you look at our budget, there's only one addition in our budget for 2021, and that is the clothes closet to fund that. And I think that's very important. But I look at this I think there's a lot more we can do, not just with deacon ministry, but with the church as we look at our impoverished community and how we can minister to them. But I want to define poverty according to what Chester has to say, because I think we look at poverty wrong many times. 
He says this, poverty is about the lack of income and resources, but an, ab but an absolute and a relative lack. But these things are symptoms of underlying issues. At root, poverty is about broken relationships, relationship to God, within and between communities, and with the environment. Poverty is social as well as economic. God has made us stewards of creation to contribute to community life, but the poor become non-contributors. They're forced to be passive. The result is a loss of dignity, confidence, and hope that in turn become significant factors in keeping them in poverty. So poverty is about marginalization, vulnerability, isolation, and exclusion. And so the Bible refers to the widow and orphan to represent those who are vulnerable because of their marginalized status. You see, often we just see the physical needs of the poor without understanding the underlying issues. And when we give them a handout, we actually may be adding to the problem. When Jesus began his earthly ministry, he quoted this verse from Isaiah 61. He said, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. Jesus announced that he fulfilled that scripture passage when he read it. But Jesus didn't eradicate poverty. Jesus said that, in fact, that the poor will always be with us. Chester reflects on this when he says, we must contend with the fact that most of the poor will remain poor throughout their lives. The hope of, God, of the gospel is not hope for change in this life. It is not hope that our work and labor will bring about transformations in history. He goes on and says, we cannot eradicate poverty within history. Our achievements may be reversed and undone, but we still have an obligation to care for the poor as we reflect on the character of God. What we can do with the impoverished is bring hope and dignity to those that are marginalized in their community. Like Jesus, proclamation will be central to Christian involvement with the poor because the greatest need of the poor, along with all people, is to be reconciled with God through the gospel. But this message we proclaim is best understood in the context of loving actions and loving community. Chester goes on and reflects on Jesus as our example. He said, Jesus made it a point of including the marginalized and sinners. The religious people of his day despised him for it. It is striking as well that the New Testament, there is no talk of social projects. Instead, the New Testament talks about the church being the church, a caring, gracious, an inclusive community with a message proclaimed. We are to include the poor in the network of believing relationships. In this way, we offer them dignity, belonging, and inclusion. You see, many times the most important thing we can offer people is dignity, belonging, and inclusion. Chester goes on to say this. He said, social involvement can't be simply about providing goods and services to the poor. Good social involvement takes place when the poor are enabled to make choices and bring about change. Poverty creates hopelessness and powerlessness, which demean the dignity that God has given people and denies them the opportunity to work and to serve others. The poor internalize this powerlessness and hopelessness, and they internalize their oppression as a lack of self-confidence. And again, Brett Meyer, he quotes this man, and he describes the goal of development as change people in just and peaceful relationships. He goes on and says, by change people, I mean people who have discovered their true identity of children of God and have recovered their true vocation as faithful and productive stewards of gifts from God 
for the well-being of all. You see, if you look at Jesus' ministry, he only fed people twice, didn't he? He didn't go around doing social actions. But what Jesus did was bring a message of healing and hope to those that society ignored and considered worthless. Whether it was the prostitutes or the lepers, Jesus reached out to them and helped them overcome the stigma of society and bring dignity to their lives. Chester goes on and says this, Strengthening the weak is about enabling people to exercise their God-given rule over creation for the good of all. That is what stewardship is. So good social involvement involves more than providing for the poor. We want people to regain their God-given dignity as human beings made to contribute to community life. So at the heart of good social action is the participation of those in need. Chapter concludes with what the role will be as a church as we minister to the poor and help them fulfill their purpose. He says we might see reform in society. We might not. The important thing is for the church to witness the coming liberation of God. We are called to be a jubilee community in which the poor are welcomed, included, and strengthened. We are the place on earth where God's future can be seen. And what I would say with that is, as we are looking to how are we going to reach our community, we have many people in our community that fit the description he has here, whether they are economically poor or they're impoverished in other ways. They're, they lack power. They lack hope. I know many people that are in the tribe here that make lots of money, but they're impoverished. They don't have dignity. They don't have purpose. And so the gospel brings all of those things to bear on that. And it's the church that allows that. I think our church has done very well of including people of different races from our community. But I think if you look at our church role and who comes to our church, there are very, very few, if any, that are poor that we would be considered poor in our community here. And I think we've got to bridge that gap in being able to do that. And I want to I want to conclude tonight by just sharing from my heart my own story. Because as I read through his book, I really looked at what Chester had to say about the poor. And I have a part of that in my own testimony. Now again, I've never been really, really poor. There have been times in our lives where we didn't have money. But what I do know is that when I became a Christian and for the first few, few years as a Christian, I didn't have dignity. I didn't feel empowered. I felt that hopelessness and that hurt, especially when I was going through a divorce. And what was interesting is, as I think about my journey, the church didn't put together a plan and look at this poor divorced guy over there in the corner crying on Sunday mornings and say, we need to have a plan to help him. What they did was included me in ministry. These were people that, you know, were professionals, you know, nurses and people in the white collar world that reached out to a blue collar guy that socially was not in their class. But I became a part of ministry. And what was important was they needed me. And they used me. And I became friends with them. And we did ministry together. And I saw God being able to use me in ministry. And so even though my social status didn't change, my status in the church changed. And those people that normally would not have ever given me the time of day outside the church became some of my very best friends. And it took place in a manner that was natural because they saw my giftings and they saw my abilities. I was a mechanic. I became the mechanic for a mission organization. But it wasn't very long after I became the mechanic for the mission organization. They said, Randall, 
we're all going to be out of town, so would you lead a group into Mexico? And I'm going, I'm not even sure I know the road. But they entrusted me with that. And you know what? It empowered me and helped raise me up. And through those years, I started realizing that I am not lesser than other people. And I really think that that is part of what we can do as a church, is that we can bring comfort to the brokenhearted, but we can see captives released, that they can, people can find their dignity, and people can find their place. Because the reality is, and I started this sermon with me, and I'm ending it with me, is that now where I am, in my position in life where I'm no longer economically poor and I stand before you guys each Sunday, it's real easy to forget where I came from. And I think it's easy for us all to forget where we came from because we were all broken sinners, desperately in need of Jesus. And he came to us, which is what Christmas is about as we enter the Christmas season, isn't it? God came down from heaven became one of us, but never looked at us in pity. He looked at us as his children and gave us salvation. And I think as a church, as we look at how we're going to do ministry and how are we going to use this facility and all the things that God has blessed us with to reach our community, I think what we've got to do sometimes is we need to step down from our high positions and mingle with the people who are just like us. And they are just like us. And I think that it's not they as the poor. Jesus said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And I think we must always walk in humility. And we never come to a place where we feel like we've arrived or we're better than anyone. And we're in this battle together and we're in that battle with them. And I believe that's the, the message that we have. And what allows us to continue to always have that message before us is communion. I love the fact that we do communion because it is the great equalizer. It matters not <clears throat> what race somebody is, what social status they are, when they come to the communion table, what we're saying is, I desperately need Jesus. I need him every moment of every day that my salvation is totally dependent on him and nothing else, and I'm trusting in him and nothing else for my salvation. That is the message of our church, and that's the message that we want to always put forward in our community because we're no better than anyone out there matter of fact we are all equal sinners and we all need God's grace and I think that is if we keep that mentality when we go forth I think God will help us he will use us to reach his community for the gospel so if you would mask up and come get some communion and we're going to take it together as we conclude our service this evening, whenever you come together, remember what I've done for you. He said, when you take this bread, remember that it was my body that took your place and died on that cross that you deserve. Let's eat together. And when we look at the cup, and it's a kind of a message that's flowed throughout all of this reading is that simply we could say that when Jesus came, he, re he came to restore the image of God in us, didn't he? And it's through his blood that that image is partially restored now as we reflect Jesus and are mostly like him or somewhat like him, but someday we will be like him, as John says. As he is, we will be. And so the message of the gospel is restoring the image of God in us. The image of God created every person for. 
And that's a message that we need to take to every person, regardless of what the world has done to them to damage them and hurt them and destroy them. We are able to be restored because of the blood of Jesus. Let's drink. Let's close in prayer. Father, we just thank you for sending your Son to be the Savior of the world. And as we are entering into the Christmas season over the next few weeks, as we celebrate the Incarnation, Lord, help us to remember the distance you traveled to save us. And Lord, help us to be willing to travel that distance for our neighbors, for those that live around us, to take the wonderful good news of what you've done into this world. Lord, help us to see our neighbors as you see them. Help us to love them as you love them and help us to have your heart and your mind as we include them in to the lives that you've given us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand and close with our benediction. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor.